Good morning, church. It's so great to be with you today. Uh, I'd like to just take this opportunity to welcome you uh, and say how much we have just really, really missed you. And, and I know that you have missed us as well. And so I'm so, so thankful, though, that we get to uh, do this on camera so that we can share our lives one with another and and just have this opportunity to be together. Uh, I'd like to say, first of all, before we go into our questions, that I'm so thankful for our church staff and all that they've done to make all of this possible. I know you are too. We feel so very blessed to have one another, to be able to work together with the things that God has given us to uh, produce a service that God can bless us in. Before we get started, though, I would like for Pastor Steve just to share with you what we're doing and how we're doing it. Hey, uh, several years we've been doing something called Hot Seat Sunday, and you guys asked the question, and we're put in the hot seat and try to answer it, and that's kind of the theme. So uh, we decided to do it again, and you guys have been sending in questions uh, over the internet and submitting them, and uh, we've kind of summarized those and boiled them down, and uh, we're taking some of those questions because there were a lot, but we tried to pick the most uh, valued or the most asked type question, and so that's what we're going to do. And so, uh, but I want you to know that this isn't meant to be a Bible school lesson. This isn't meant to be a sermon as such with, uh, you know, every scripture and detail and backup. It's just uh, questions you guys are asking and as it comes from our heart and uh, as your pastor's answering back to you. So just remember that. And we're actually going to limit our time to about five minutes maximum if, if we can. We might go over some, but we might go way shorter too. So it's not meant to include every thought or answer. So just remember that. Don't be too mad or upset with us. And just uh, hear our hearts and uh, uh, hear, hopefully you'll be encouraged by our answers. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Believe it or not, we do this almost every morning. We set it at our table together as we're doing our devotion. And I'm always bothering Pastor Steve with questions. Uh, I'm reading and I come across something in the Bible that I'm like, I don't understand or I just kind of want to talk about. And I turn to him and I say, what do you think about this? And he's always like, I'm trying to do my devotion. So here's a question. Here's our first question. Um, we're all thinking about the, the virus that's going on. So lots of you have had questions about that. So is the uh, coronavirus from God or from the devil? Well, you know, uh, when I hear that, well, the first thing that comes to me, like, okay, is it good or is it evil? Because that's where people are trying to sort through or why would God allow that? So we're going to deal with that a little bit as we go on. But I believe that God is the creator. He is the creator of all things. He created everything, all matter. Yes. All things, including bacteria and virus and everything else. And the devil is... Uh, I've never seen him have created power. He has um, counterfeit power, and he he um, tries to duplicate things, but he doesn't have creative power, and he's not all powerful. He's not all in control, and whatever he's doing, God is allowing. So um, that from that point, you know, God creates matter. He creates life. He, a virus wouldn't have life without God. Uh, he creates the systems. He creates gravity and light and heat and water and oxygen. He, he provides all of that stuff and DNA. But as I even think about that, he's also the one who creates the antibodies so that when we get the virus, he created our body so beautifully and so wonderfully made that we have the ability to fight off these terrible things that get somehow yes. released in this world. And so as we hear on the news, so many people have no symptoms or very minor symptoms, and that's the way God has created this wonderful body. So uh, he created viruses, but does he you know, send it? And uh, when you look at it like that, is this God sending it and trying to hurt people? No, he's created this world. 
And when he put it in motion, you know, he released everything, and man rebelled, and it's his sin that has brought death and pain and suffering. So uh, that's how I look at it from a, a simple standpoint, that uh, it is uh, something created by God, but it's not, you know, meant to be a harm for God. And when you look at it, uh, there's so many research out there. You can research uh, what you want and find out about the coronavirus and there's plenty of stuff out there. So if we feel like that God created this, the devil uses it, and God allows it, so what can we do then to uh, make sure that we are honoring God in it? Well, we honor God because we trust God. We honor God because we're not afraid. You know, uh, God says, you know, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. We honor God by trusting. We honor God by not being afraid because we're not supposed to. We honor God by praying about it because he says, put all these things in prayer and petitions, and then the peace of God will be yours. And then we honor God by uh, just uh, uh believing and trusting that he's going to take care of us as as we go through that and then we honor god by uh you know declaring him in the middle of all this and not trying to blame him for this you know because it's not him trying to hurt a world if he wanted to destroy us he could easily do that you know as i've thought about this particular question because i know that this is a question that uh, we have on our hearts, not only pertaining to this virus, but pertaining to anything that would be bad. Uh, I think of the, the scripture that's in John that says, uh, in the world, you'll have trouble. Yes. We'll have trouble. We'll have pain. We'll have sickness. We'll have suffering. But in all that, Jesus said that he had overcome the world. And if he has overcome the world, then we will overcome the world and we can count on that and not let anything no matter whether it's a virus or a, a pain or a hardship come against us uh, and to me that's hard it's it's easy to say but it's hard to uh, to live those things well I think too the, uh, I meant to say too we honor God by using wisdom because God is the source of all wisdom so we treat and act wise. We take the measures. We do the social distancing. We wash our hands. We're not flaunting this, you know, issue in front of God and saying, well, you know, we're just going to so trust him that we're now going to act foolish. And that's not honoring God either. And Jesus, you know, even said that uh, when he was tempted. So those are ways we honor God in the midst of, of a virus. Okay, let's get to our second question. Um this person says, I work with cancer patients at a children's hospital, and I'm frequently asked, how can I believe in a God who allows suffering and terrible things to happen to children? I want to share my faith with them, but can't seem to provide an acceptable answer to them. This, Please help. Yeah, this, this question comes up probably more than anything and if you want to do an internet search and in youtube or google uh, why does god allow suffering there's so much discussion out there it's just amazing because people struggle with that um but you know to me the first step that we've got to do is to trust god and believe that he's a good god he's a good god he is a good a loving god a merciful god a kind god and I think that when we're dealing with this question, sometimes people are asking this question, but they don't really want to believe. And even if we have a, the perfect answer for them, they're not going to believe. You know, that's where they're using this as, okay, I'm not going to believe in your God because he allows bad things to happen to children. But we never understood the issues of that. It's kind of like if we think about a, a good father, you know, and we're looking at this and seeing pain and suffering and death. Well, just imagine a child and you take a small child and it's old enough to comprehend what's going on and you take them to a doctor's office and then you allow the doctor to, to uh, 
scare them and hold them and look at them and touch them. And then they come over and you're, you hold them down while a doctor sticks a needle in them. And they've had shots before, so they're screaming and hollering, please, mommy, please, mommy, please, mommy, don't let this happen. Don't let this happen. So you let it happen. You hold them down, participate in it, and then in the end, you even pay the doctor to do this. So, but we know that because of that, that was a cure. Can I share something right here? Because I had something so similar happen to me uh, one time. Um, I uh, was in a car accident with my daughter, Allison. She was around two years old. And back in those days, um, people didn't wear seat belts. It's not wise. Thank God that we are wise now and we buckle our children up and we have them in car seats and we do everything within our power to uh, to keep them protected. Uh, but she was in the car and an animal ran across the road and I had to slam on brakes. And when I slammed on brakes, she came from the back seat of the car to the front seat of the car and it busted her face up. She had a huge gash in her lips. She was around two years old. Blood was pouring everywhere. A friend of mine was with us. We had all of our children in the car and we rushed her to the hospital. And at the hospital, they actually strapped her on a board uh, because she was a baby. And they strapped her arms down. They, they, uh, confined her. Okay. I'm trying to make it short, but because of that, I had to let them do this. Tears were streaming down my face. I had to literally lay on her to keep her still, but that was a good thing, but it was so painful for me. And the, and the whole story of this was like, I know our God is hurting so much. He's hurting so much. When all these things in the world are happening because our God's a good God and he's hurting so much that we're having all these pains and suffering. So that was that's just all I could say to people is our God is a good God and I know he is. And so I, I think the key, too, is the, the one key thing is that God designed this earth. And, and this is a, a little bit longer on the question, but God designed this earth to create a bride for his for eternity. To create man in a loving relationship, and he to do that, he had to give him free will. He gives us free will, and when he gives us free will, we have a will to choose, and we had the will to choose the wrong tree. We have the will for sin to come into this world. But without that choice, without that choice, there is no real love, and, and God is his highest mark of is love Mm -hmm. and he was creating mankind to be in a loving relationship through him with through eternity and he was using this world in that creation process and so you know you can argue with the process but we can't have a, a free will we can't have a loving relationship without that free will and so sin comes in suffering comes in bad people come in bad people can do things diseases can run rampant you know evil can happen and suffering happens, but ultimately, it's the next life, it's the eternal life that is the most focused area, and that God so loved the world, did he allow the suffering? Yes, because he wanted to give you free will, but it breaks his heart every time he sees suffering. And I would say to you that the most important thing you can do with us uh, to an individual when you're trying to witness to them is share your faith, share your personal experience, share how good God is to you, because those things will uh, change people's hearts. Yeah. Uh, our third question is, what makes Christianity different from other religions? Yeah, you know, a lot of people ask that because they are on the outside looking in and they say, well, this person had a book, at the Koran, or this person had these principles of Buddhism or whatever they are, and uh, all these teachings are out there, and this is just another story, another teaching. What makes it different? And the key thing is is that, you know, it wasn't one person writing that book. It was, you know, 40 different authors spending over thousands of years accumulating these prophetic documents 
well, 66 different books written in different languages, and they all come together perfectly with this message of the Messiah, Jesus promised, and that when he came, he came exactly fulfilling every one of those promises. They're not in all those other books and all those other religions. And then he predicted that he would die on the cross and that he would raise, and he did it, mm-hmm. and he forgives sins, and he restores the relationship with God. And no other religion does that. No other religion has a God that's so loved. He would come down and, yes. and make the things right. And uh, that sets us apart completely from everyone. It's a personal living relationship, a loving relationship that he desired and that he designed and that he, it's proven over and over and over again. If you do the evidence, if you search the evidence, you'll find that it's all true and uh, the Bible's true and you can trust the Bible and you can trust Jesus. Amen. I love the witness that we have in our hearts too, that. How do I know I'm saved? I know that I know that I know that I know because the Holy Spirit's presence dwells inside of us. And Mm -hmm. and I I know that that's something that you can't explain to people. This is a fun question. The very next one. uh, How do you explain dinosaurs in relation to the Bible? Yeah, I think that some people think that because like like Christians don't believe in dinosaurs or something, well, you know, uh, all you got to do is watch the movies and you'll see them. Yeah. But uh, there are several passages in the, the scripture, and you can do your own search if you want to go, go search it, where they're describing creatures uh, with tails as big as cedar trees and, and, and these enormous beasts, and they're like describing dinosaurs, and so they are there. Uh, there's some people who believe dinosaurs could have been on the ark and, you know, survives, you know, they didn't have to have every species. They just put one or two or three species and they preserve dinosaurs. But the dinosaurs are real. They're there. The Bible doesn't have any contradiction uh, like they shouldn't be there. Uh, there's scientific evidence for them. Uh, it's just whether they're the oldest they say they are. And that's where there's a lot of debate and a lot of science and different people uh, doing it. In fact, when I was younger, uh, I was visiting my sister in uh, near uh, Texas. And there's a town nearby called Glen Rose. And we went down along the river and there's a place now called Dinosaur Park. And mm-hmm. there are the layers of silt over the years. And back in the ni- early 1900s, they stumbled them on these things and farmers used to cut them out and sell them on the side of the road until they you know set it aside as a park but they actually have pictures there where there's a a dinosaur big huge dinosaur track maybe as big as this and then there look looks just like the human gate human walk human footprints in the same mud um now, whether there's some controversy, sometimes they try to make other footprints by carving them out because, you know, they could sell those too. But we don't know that man and dinosaur didn't exist for a period of time because the scientists and their dating and aging, is it, it's all confusing. But I do know that they're real and uh, they just, for some reason, they didn't survive. Just like thousands and millions, I don't know how many species have not survived. And uh, so the dinosaurs in the Bible, there is no problem with the dinosaurs in the Bible, as far as I'm concerned. Kids love them. Yeah, kids <laughs> love them. Everybody loves dinosaurs, <laughs> except the live ones. You know, we don't want those, uh, but uh, we like the pictures of them. Yeah, they like to play with them, and they like to think about them. Yeah. Um, question number five uh, says this, and this is one that's, about us particularly. It says, your marriage is an inspiration to others. Uh, what do you consider to be the keys to a healthy marriage relationship? Mm. Well, I, I've spoken on this a lot um, over the years. And, uh, you know, our relationship is, I think, very wonderful and special. But it has its bumps in the road, too. And I think several keys that I can think of off the top of my head and you can add is uh, first is just a decision to choose and a commitment to love mm-hmm. that that's what we're going to do we're going to love just like we choose to love God 
and we don't question God because our baby dies or our friend dies or it's coronavirus or anything. We don't. We just love God, and we're going to keep loving because He's good. And so you choose love, and then you choose to live in forgiveness, which is an ongoing every day. You just choose to forgive every day. Forgive, 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 forgive. And you don't let your feelings rule you because we'll hurt each other. We'll say something. We'll do something. And you can either let your feelings be ruling or you can choose. I'm going to love. I'm going to forgive. And that ultimately there is no breaking of this relationship. I think early on we made a decision. There will be no divorce. You have to make that decision. And then everything else works around that backwards. You don't stay married because you worked it out. No, you work it out because you're going to stay married. Yeah. And then you have Jesus in the middle of it. And if we both believe that we have each other's best in mind, goodwill towards each other, then we're, we're going to bleed the best and we'll figure it out. Uh, first and foremost, I think our relationship is as good as it is because of God. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because God gives us the ability to then choose to love and to forgive. Um, but I can remember in our early years when we were first married and first in love, because I think people are trying to say, what did you do to develop this relationship that you have one with another? And I can remember deliberately uh, choosing things uh, to do for you in particular. You know, the Bible says if we love God, we will choose to please him. Right. So I w would remember I would look like a bum all day long. Because you were at home with the kids. Because I was at home with the kids. And I knew you were going to be home at a certain time. And I would purposely then go up, wash myself, wash my face, put good looking clothes on and be ready for you when you got home. Mm. Because I was looking forward to seeing you. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And she was always beautiful. And I felt like I remember reading material about how important that was. Yeah. And if I really loved you, then I wanted to show that I loved you. And that was one simple way that I could show that I loved you. And then I remember... What, moving into a point in our life where uh, I would get upset with you, terribly upset over things that uh, I didn't like, particularly when I didn't feel like you were spending enough time with me and the children. And I would always communicate those feelings, but then I had to deliberately choose to not allow those feelings to come between us mm. and I think that because I wanted to have that loving relationship I knew I was wasting time precious time of us loving one another being mad at one another yeah. so I was like this we need to make up fast here this doesn't need to go on forever and ever. So we've always kept our arguments uh, short. Yes. And intense but short. Yes, intense but short. <laughs> and we've always, and you know, my son, Brian, blessed us at our 50th wedding anniversary when he said his parents taught him to choose love, yeah. to choose love every day. Yeah. And I think that's what we have done. I think that it's our intentionality. It definitely, without Jesus uh, in the middle of us, we wouldn't have held to the commitment, and we wouldn't have had the principles, because forgiveness, choosing love, uh, ruling your feelings, your thoughts, your mind, all those are principles that God teaches us, and we, are, we had been learning for you know, all those years and applying them. But that's the key, is you've got to know the Word, you've got to apply the Word, and you've got to apply it every day of your life. And then just uh, we chose to always be intimate, you know, keep keep the no anger and be intimate and share and be open and transparent and talk a lot. So yes. 
I think those are all the principles that uh, you know have kept us strong and and enjoying one another. So we've run out of time on those questions. So now let's let's do this one. Um, as much as we like to reject the doctrine of predestination and election, they are in the Bible. So how do you explain the doctrine of election without compromising one's choice or free will? You know, there's a lot of pastors out there and have for years, and now there's younger ones that have been really mega pastors that have, you know, they're, they're preaching the predestination, which means essentially the sovereignty of God and meaning that, you know, God predestines whether, because He knows everything, He, he believes, they believe that uh, He has predestined some to go to heaven and some to go to hell. And they have all kind of good explanations, and, and yes, there is scriptures that if you look at those, they they seem to talk about predestination and God knowing and all these other things. But there's also scriptures that talk about our free will and, and that, that's that creation process in the beginning where God created us uniquely out of all of his creation with the free will. And in that, uh, my doctrine cannot align with a God that would choose to send anyone to hell. And there's so many scriptures. He says it's not his will yeah. that any anyone should perish. perish. Yes. <laughs> and that God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, not just the chosen ones. Uh, and why would he do that if it wasn't necessary? And you know, there's so many, many places there where he wants a, a loving relationship. And so you see those scriptures, can God know everything? And, and, you know, we're trying to also put an infinite God and be able to explain him. And I think that's where we err on many times. We cannot take an infinite God with a simple question, and can he know everything, and has he predestined everyone to either heaven or hell? See, those are two things that I think are way beyond our, our ability to comprehend. Because I just always go back to all the scripture that talks about his love, his goodness, his dying for all of our sins, his uh, desire for all those things. And so uh, that's why I believe that we have the free will to choose life or not to choose it, and our free will to tell others. And that's why we go to India. That's why we do mission work all around the world, because if it was, if everybody's already predestined, well, hey, we can stay at home and take it easy. We can just keep our mouth shut and not tell people. Well, we're called to tell people because life and death is in our confession and in our death testimony. Yes. So... Uh, I think it's uh, the, I think it's very dangerous. And when you look at the people who say they're chosen, they say, well, how do you know you're chosen? Well, they say, because I do all these things. I study my Bible. I go to church and blah, blah, blah. And I say, in other words, it's based on things you do <laughs> that you know you're saved. And that's, you know, faith without works. No, it's not based on what you do. And ultimately, I, it's just me as a father to sit here and say, I have a child and then say, well, God may have predestined them to hell. Well, I know that's not the God that I love and serve. And so that's, that's when you put those things together, you look and he has predestined. Yet Did he predestine all men yes. to come into salvation? He's predestined this world in certain ways. He's predestined a plan for our salvation. He's predestined eternity. But I think when it comes to heaven and hell, that that's not the way God uses it, and it's not clear in the scriptures that way. And uh, and I'll say it this way: there is some scriptures which, if you listen to just that teacher, oh, you'll believe that way. But if you listen to another one, you'll believe that way. But I believe that God puts just enough in there. He would have made it clear if He wanted it. But I know what I trust and believe in, and that's a good God that loves us, and that we choose Him. He's choosing us. Yes, does he choose us? And yes, we're choosing him. And uh, do we have a free will? Yes, we do. And that leads us to closing, that every one of us have a free will to choose Jesus, mm -hmm. to believe what he said, that he died on that cross for our sins, that, that God so loved the world, he allowed his son to come and do that. 
but whoever believes in him should have eternal life. And that's a choice to believe. Belief, faith is a choice. Do you believe? Will you choose that? You have a free will today as you're listening to this questions. You have a free will to choose Jesus. And demons and hell and everything in your mind and all the, the torments of your pain and whether you question God about suffering and creation and evolution, all those are different questions because you're never going to know all the answers. The real question is, do you choose Jesus? He loves you. He died for you. And will you just choose him and accept what he did on that cross? And then as you start following him, he'll open an understanding of so much more to you. So I'm going to lead you in some prayer. Yeah. And I just want you to just pray along with me, just or agree with me, as you say. Just let this be your prayer. And if you've never received Jesus Christ, then you do it today. You choose Christ today. You have the free will. You're not predestined to go to hell. That's right. But you're predestined to hear a message that Jesus loves you and because you're now hearing it. And that's the choice that you make. So let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your love. We're so grateful for your salvation, Jesus, and what you did on that cross. And so, Lord, now... Each and every one here, Lord, let this be our prayer that we choose Jesus. I choose you, Jesus. I choose to believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That he was the Son of God and he died on that cross for my sins and he rose from the dead proving his truth and proving that he will give us life eternal. He will raise us to a new life eternal. So today, Jesus, I choose you. I choose to believe in you. I put all my faith in you, my trust in you, my hope in you. Even for the places I still don't understand, I'm going to believe in you. And I ask you for your salvation, and I give thanks to you now. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me as I begin this journey with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you made that choice today, then I want to invite you to click on one of those connect buttons, if depending what medium you're in, Facebook, and you know, go in the comment bar there. And if you're on our website, go up to the top corner. I think there's a connect button there. Click that. They'll ask you to give us your email so that I can send you some helpful information, but also just to say, this is my confession. Let me know that. Believe and confess. Tell others, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, your, your family that you have believed in Christ. And let me send you this information. We praying for you. Uh, and so those are all good news. And uh, we'll be excited about hearing about that from you. So let me also close. I don't get a chance to pray with you and for you so much. I want to close with a pastoral blessing over your life. Father, I thank you so much for these people, everyone who's listening, everyone who believes. They're your believers, Father. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for them. Mm -hmm. And God, for their faithfulness to serve you, to love you, to follow you, to obey you, to please you. Mm -hmm. And that's what we declare, Father. Lord, we come and pray angels yes, guard Father. them, their homes, their businesses, yes, their lives, and protect them from Shield any harm, them. any virus. Yes. And whatever they go through, Lord, oh, they will go through trusting With you, learning and growing in faith. Lord, whether yes. it's sickness or loss of job, yes, that's Lord. not the key. Amen. That they still have their Dear faith Lord. in you, yes, Jesus, Father. because Comfort eternity them, is their destination and Comfort ultimate home. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness and giving and yes, serving Lord. and for being a witness to yes. their neighbors and their friends and family. And I bless them, Lord. Bless them. May your face shine Lord, upon them God. and give them peace. Yes, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.